You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this podcast series. And today's conversation will focus on baby boomers as a generation. How does this group differ from other generations that came before and after? Why do they have such sway on commercial markets and what opportunities exist for marketers to reach this key segment of the population? Joining me today is Joanne Jenkins and she's the Chief Executive Officer of AARP, the world's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization that empowers people to choose how they live as they age. And she's also the best-selling author of the book, Disrupt Aging, A Bold New Path to Living your best life at every age. Joanne also holds a board and advisory positions with several leading corporate and nonprofit groups, including, including General Mills and the Wall Street Journal CEO Council. Joanne, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's my pleasure. So Joanne, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and experience at AARP and, and what AARP does. So AARP's mission is really to enhance the quality of life as we age. Uh, And I think that's so important because what we want to do is empower our members to choose how they live as they age throughout the course of their lifetime. Uh, And I had the opportunity to become the CEO of AARP in 2014. Prior to that, I spent 25 years in both the executive branch and legislative branch working for two different presidents and four different cabinet secretaries before coming to AARP, first as the chairman of their for-profit company, and then on staff as the president of the foundation, the chief operating officer of AARP, and then in 2014, the CEO. So, What a, what a remarkable career. And um, your government career is amazing as well, You know, having gone through several administrations. I remember the AARP commercials, you know, if you haven't heard about AARP, you don't know ARP. And (laughs) I'll never forget those commercials. And I'll never forget when my ARP card arrived at my 50th birthday. I don't know how you knew (laughs) when my birthday was, but uh, thank you for the card. But talk about what, you know, the broad range. I mean, ARP does so many different things. Well, so first and foremost, we are a social change organization. AARP is a 501c4. We have a C3 uh, a charitable arm, and then we have AARP Services, which is our for-profit company. Uh, but our job really is to, to drive social impact and focus on those issues that are important to people 50 and older in this country. Uh, and that's a huge segment of the population. But more broadly, in the last uh, year since I've been CEO, we've sort of broadened that to say 50 plus members and their families, because so much of what the 50, 60, 70 year old is doing is sort of that sandwich generation and really having to take care of their kids or grandkids or taking care of their a spouse or a grandparent. Yeah. And, you know, the 50 plus that, that what is that about a third of the uh, of the total population? And, so, and, and, and so every baby boomer is in that range and is really the focus. And, and that's why that, you know, that's why the, I think you're just such an expert on, on this group. I know that, you know, marketers and, you know, organizations like ours tend to focus on, you know, the newest generation and that's millennials and Gen Z and so forth. But this is a huge group, this baby boomer group. And, you know, they're not finished, right? <laughs> they're not done yet. And so talk about the, the demographic. So they're, they're certainly not done yet. Uh, baby boomers were born between 1946 to 1964. Uh, the youngest is about 57 and the oldest is around 75. And they represent some 71 million people who fall into that baby 
boomer demographics. But I think it's also important because we see such similarities in some of the other age groups. So Gen Xers who are from 1965 to 1980 represent 65 million people and the millennials who are going to turn 50 in 2030 represent 72 million people. So this idea that we are all uh, living longer and hopefully healthier are going to be in that A or P range of 50 plus for a, for a very long period of time. Yeah, and so to all of our um, millennial listeners to this podcast series, we just want to point out you're going to be 50 soon too. Very <laughs> soon. Very soon. It, it happens to all of us. Well, it, but you know, the other thing is this is a group that not unlike, you know, the, the waves of previous generations, but you know, you accumulate your wealth during your working years. And so this is a wealthy group, you know, even though it's, it's a piece of the population, they are, they over index on the amount of wealth they control. Talk about that and what it means. So relatively speaking, and, and, and the way we like to talk about this, Steve, is to really think about life stages that people are in. But this, particularly these boomers, you know, when we think of them in terms of their life stage, you know, they're, they're thinking about when am I going to retire or if I'm ever going to retire, uh, do I need to downsize or is the whole family moving back in with us? Are they becoming a first time grandparent or are they becoming a caregiver? And all those things make a difference in how they spend their money. When I was looking at the statistics, the U.S. Bureau of Labor tells us that the average take home pay for boomers is around sixty seven thousand five. $500 after taxes. And so that's that's relatively a large amount of money for the majority of people who live uh, in this age bracket. They spend about $18,900 on housing, roughly $10,000 on transportation, $7,300 on food, and you know, just a little over $6,000 a year on health care. And so, you know, as you said earlier, they are relatively stable for the most part, uh, particularly those who have stayed in the workforce longer. And we are, we are definitely seeing that people are working well into their 70s, uh, whereas when Social Security and Medicare were put in place some 80 years ago, you were expected to retire somewhere between 55 and 62. Uh, and die uh, somewhere around 67 or 68. So we're already living some 15, 20 years longer than probably our grandparents lived and continuing to work for some 30 or 40 years as compared to 20 or 25 years, which, when, which was, was the case when Social Security was put in place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating how, how much that dynamic has changed in, in life expectancy has changed. And that's, you know, that's directly due to the quality of quality of living in the medical care. You know, this, this boomer generation is different. I mean, it, it, and I know we say that about every generation, but, you know, there are attitudinal difference be differences between the boomer generation and uh, the generation that, that preceded it. What drives that? And then, and then talk about the differences between boomers themselves, because I think, you know, the early boomers and late boomers, you know, as you said, 57 to 75, you know, those, those are two different groups and two different attitudinal sure. segments. Well, I think, first of all, you know, as I said, people are living longer, they're working into their 70s, and they're contributing to the economy. And this 50 plus demographics are driving the economy, what we call the longevity economy, and they represent $8.3 trillion of economic activity on an annual basis. That's 56 cents of every dollar spent by someone who's in that boomer category. And so one of the other interesting pieces is that 44% of all the jobs that were held or created by people 50 plus, they represent some 88 million jobs to the economy. And that's projected to grow to over 100 million by 2050. So I think it's so important for marketers and products and service providers to be looking at this generation as an opportunity. And so, so many times we see marketers focused on that uh, Gen Z, Gen X audience who may not have the kind of financial resources to spend in the marketplace as boomers. Yeah, I grew up in the in the consumer products world, and you know every brand wants the the youngest generation. And and if they had the 
you know, if, if they skewed 55 plus in their, in their purchasing, they worried about it because they said, oh, you know, we're going to lose. And, but I, I think what's not realized is that there's this life cycle, you know, product life cycle in, in, in different needs. And so it's not a mistake to market to people who are 55 plus because you're always having, as you said, a generation behind it that, that wants those kinds of products and services. You know, talk about that because it's, it's yeah. you know, people always say, well, let's, you know, we want to invest on the front end of the life cycle, but that's not necessarily always the right thing to do. Well, even if I think about our own marketplace in terms of AERP, we have 38 million members. We're the largest membership organization in this country. And their buying power, their attention to detail and where they get their information is usually from their kids or grandkids who are who are telling them what they ought to be purchasing. And we've seen that we've actually seen a big shift in the use of marketing dollars in this last two years as a result of COVID. Uh, so many older adults, boomers have really learned to use technology in ways that they never thought they would even have an interest to do. Television uh, has just gone through the roof in terms of its acceptability uh, as a result of COVID and you know being in your home and having to entertain yourself at home. And so I think all of those things are important. And one of the things we've tried to, as we talk to entrepreneurs, is to say, you know, what's good for the old is also good for the young, that we ought to be creating ageless solutions in the marketplace. Because if you buy, if you build something that only is suited for an older person, old people won't buy it either. And so you really have to think multi-generational in terms of your furniture design, house design. We've seen so many people uh, spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars retro uh, fitting their home, building outdoor entertainment spaces. And, and that's, I think, so uh, important for the time we in, we're in and reflective of how we're going to be living in the next 20, 30, 40 years, that we're going to be moving into our home, either for the first time or second time, but staying there. Because we know that over 85% of people over the age of 50 tell us they want to age in their own home. They don't necessarily want to go to a nursing facility or care facility. We know some people will have to do that. But for the large part, people want to continue to live in their home uh, for their, you know, the well into their old age. And I think that's going to be important for the building industry and the technology industry and everything, every group that has uh, something that they sell that fits inside the home. Well, you know, it, you mentioned uh, the, the lifespan difference too. So, you know, people who are retirees today are, are not just sitting in a wheelchair in a home. I mean, obviously some, some, some are, but you know, they're not the old grannies. These are people that are out with active lifestyles. They're on the tennis courts. They're in, the, you know, they're on the golf courses. They're engaged at, you know, what, and, and people are working till 70 and longer. I mean, this is a different, completely different attitudinal and active generation than generations before it. And so the mindset needs to change in terms of, 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 of thinking about the opportunity with that group. Well, I, that is so right because, you know, you know, pre-pandemic, this group spent $394, you know, on kinds of purchasing powers on an annual basis for uh, surplus kind of things that almost tripled to over 900 and something dollars. Uh, and so you see the, the value of their financial resilience and their uh, longer periods of savings through the course of the lifetime. I think it's also important that particularly when we talk to marketers, you know, we say to them, you know, you still need to be looking at this older adults. They're not an afterthought. They're not a nice to have, but they really should be look, looking at as a major market segment uh, that marketers should be attracted to. And I think that's so important. Their massive purchasing power, as I said, you know, $8.3 trillion in 2018, 56% uh, of every dollar's they hold 44% of all the jobs uh, that were created and their wages and salaries generated uh, for people over 50 was $5.7 trillion in, in 2018. And that's projected to go to almost 18 trillion by 2050. So, uh, you know, I, I remember the early days 
of, you know, trying to talk to some of these major brands and they, you know, they were all focused on the young and, you know, and now we look at it and say, oh, the young doesn't necessarily have the kind of financial means. Uh, most of them are not most of them. A lot of them have moved back home as a result of COVID or because of, you know, the financial uh, condition that they find themselves in. And it's really, the, they are really the first generation that their parents are still earning more than they're earning. And so that's going to be, have major implications for how we look at market segmentation and how companies think about where they invest their research dollars, you know, how startups, I will say this, that we have seen an enormous shift during COVID to the recognition, particularly in the technology industry, particularly in the care industry, health industry, of thinking about ageless solutions, whether it's around caregiving or whether it's around, you know, as I said earlier, doing telemedicine or addressing issues of isolation because so many of older adults live alone and the use of, you know, the technology, whether it be like a Zoom call or Microsoft Teams. I'm sitting here at my home office and I have one, two, three, four, five devices, two cell phones, a laptop, iPad, and my uh, my PC here uh, on my desk to be able to do it. But that's not that's not unusual. That's more the norm these days. Yeah. So so far, we've talked about the characteristics that set baby boomers apart from other generations and why this demographic has such immense buying power. Next, we'll explore the marketing opportunities unique to this important consumer segment. We'll take a short break and be right back. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world? And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board. And I'm so pleased to be joined today by Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP. Joanne, you were just talking before the break about this, you know, the, the, the enormous change, the enormous buying power, you know, the, you, were, you were saying you've got all these devices and there's just opportunity everywhere in, in all of this. Talk about, you know, the challenges, you know, you, you started to talk about some of them, but talk about the challenges that, uh, that boomers are facing, health, retirement, diet, and then how, they, how these challenges become opportunities to marketers. Well, I think, you know, first, uh, as we think about the workplace, people are staying in the workplace longer. The opportunity that uh, COVID has presented is this uh, a large uh, swath of the uh, employees are continuing to work at home. So you're no longer having to, you know, commute back and forth to work, uh, which is also one of the things that most older workers dreaded having to get in the car to do that. So, you know, the use of uh, technology and work from home has uh, helped to resolve some of those issues. Uh, The idea that this particular generation is usually like the sandwich generation, that they're looking at, you know, how can they make their life more convenient? You know, how can they help their parents or grandparents who may or may not live in the same city where they're located. So they're looking for convenience. They're looking for healthcare, almost like an ombudsman uh, in the healthcare industry as they think about their own personal future, but also, uh, you know, dealing with everyday issues. I often tell uh, people on the Hill, members of Congress, that the one issue that we can all agree on is that you're either going to need a caregiver or be a caregiver. And how do you think about providing that long distance care? for someone you care about or for yourself or a loved one in the household that you're in. So enormous opportunities, as I said, in the healthcare space, in the convenience space for, you know, how we buy our groceries, you know, how we buy merchandise, whether from Amazon or some other online service, and really looking at the ease of use Uh, This particular generation is, as I said, comfortable online, 
but uh, the simplest technology that gets the person what it is they want to purchase uh, to their home are likely going to benefit hugely as a result of the technology. And so you see their purchasing power, you see how they're spending their dollars. They're very much interested in travel and experiences. We see a huge shift in the the amount of money that they spend on travel and entertainment and not so much on gifts, but on experiences. And so there's a huge opportunity there, one that we're looking at, I might say, uh, in terms of how, you know, how do we provide experiences, meaningful, educational, fun experiences for this large group of um, group of the population. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's hard for marketers sometimes to understand. I, I think this group, you know, it's, they just don't want to get into all the, the bits and the bytes of the technology. They don't want to understand the program. They, they just want it to work because they want to use it as a tool. It's so, so technology and, and, you know, automobiles and everything, it's a tool so that they can, you know, sort of deal with the higher order things. And I, I think that is, understanding the mindset, it's not that, that they don't want to learn this stuff or they can't learn this stuff or, you know, they don't have the mental faculties for, you know, for technology, it's just that they don't want to do it. And, and so why, why make it so difficult? And your point is simplify, simplify, simplify. And that becomes, that really becomes opportunity. You know, the other thing, Joanne, that, that is interesting is prior to this generation, I think going back throughout human history, there were multiple generations living in every household. And so, you know, typically, you know, at least two, but sometimes three and, and maybe more in a household and, and you, you know, you were able to blend the skill sets and the experiences within a given household, you know, for, for care and for, you know, uh, you know, however that, is. but in this society in the last 50 years, you know, households have become smaller and, and, and more divided and that, you know, that creates problems, but it also creates the opportunities as well. So talk about the household formation piece of it. So, so let me let me say first, with respect to the workforce, one of the things that we're seeing is companies are going to have to deal with four to five generations in the workplace at one time. That it's in itself creates a whole different set of dynamics for what kinds of skill sets are you looking for in in particular empl- uh, employees across the uh, spectrum. I agree with you that over the last 40 or 50 years, it's it, the household, and the type of houses we're buying are shrinking. We're also beginning to see a reverse of that. Uh, as our population becomes more and more diverse, then you're starting to see, and as a result of COVID with uh, young adults moving back home, you know, this whole idea of adult dwelling units where you're actually going to either build a, convert a garage or build a separate adult dwelling unit in the back of your home to care for someone in the future, I think is 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 key to the building industry in the future. But more than anything, it's they're looking for convenience and uh, simplicity in the household. You see that in some of the housing designs, the idea that master bedrooms are now being built on the first floor, that you know you could actually stay on one floor. That's good for not just the old, but also for, with young parents who have kids you know, in terms of use of strollers and all of those kind of things, getting back to that ageless design. And I think it's going to be uh, a unique opportunity to think about what will the house of the future look like? How will it accommodate uh, the kinds of things that we've gotten used to in this COVID environment of of being entertained at home? Uh, That You saw an explosion of people redoing their outdoor backyards and turning it into something that you might see at a resort. And so, you know, we've been working closely with the building industry. We have a strong relationship with the National Association of Realtors and some of those others in that area to sort of look at this universal design concept and how technology can come into the home, whether it's with a Google Assist or uh, Alexa or one of those other devices to help not only with medical attention, fall prevention, or, or just plain entertainment. You're never, you know, today, I, w- you know, I certainly wouldn't think of going to a movie theater when I can just go sit in my, you know, family room, living room, and watch almost any movie that just came out. And so I think that's going to be important for people to realize, you know, how do we bring those generations together under one household? Yeah. And, you know, that's the household, but then there's the workplace, you know, pre, 
pre-COVID, it was it, it was thought that the baby boomers were the ones that wanted to be in the office and that the millennials and Gen Z wanted to work remotely and use the technology. But in fact, during COVID, it was just the opposite where boomers were very comfortable in the suburbs and in their homes. And, and as you said, well, you know, collecting devices to, to communicate, it was the young generations that missed the socialization of the offices and were climbing the walls in their small studio apartments. So it, it really is different. And I think that this, you know, you and I've talked about this, this is going to be, this is going to be somewhat permanent. I mean, it, it, it should ebb back a little bit as the, as COVID uh, ebbs, but, but there is permanent change here for boomers and, and, and an office uh, environment. Well, I, that is so true. And I can tell you from my own experience, you know, uh, we have all, the whole gamut of age groups uh, in our employee base. And it was those younger uh, employees who said, OK, you guys are all very comfortable in your houses in the suburbs, but we're living in an efficiency apartment downtown. Uh, and, you know, if the walls are coming in on me and how do we, you know, how do we manage and how do we get back? And I think the the answer is going to be some kind of balance between workplace flexibilities that core days or core hours in the office with the flexibility to work from home. I think that's going to be key for retaining employees and, and keeping them for longer periods of time. So I, I also think that you've seen this explosion of uh, self-employment contractors, consultants, who are uh, in many ways, I think a lot of us learned that you, you know, you didn't have to, you know, hire the company when you can hire the individual to get the kind of uh, assistance you want a consulting uh, services that you need to be able to do it. And I think those are those things are going to stay with us for a long time. And particularly as we continue to try to retain uh, and retrain uh, our existing employees, I think that's going to be key. You know, we I think we hired, you know, uh, several hundred people uh, during the last 24 months, uh, and they haven't stepped foot in our office. And so, you know, how, how companies look at culture, how do they create that company culture in a virtual environment, or a hybrid approach, I think is going to be key to survival. And uh, I think those companies that have multiple generations in the workforce who, particularly older people who understand the culture and the value of connectivity and community and really that face-to-face -face kind of communication with the enormous uh, strengths that the younger worker brings to the workforce in terms of the use of technology uh, and the use of online kind of services, you're going to need both. And I think that particularly the older generation uh, has a set of unique skill sets around culture, around responsibility, and around wisdom that I think adds value to those online conversations when, you know, we're spending six, seven hours a day on a Zoom call uh, and, and and may not have ever met the person in person. Yeah, you know, Joanne, great words of wisdom. And, you know, I, I think that uh, what you've done with AARP is really a model for marketers and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, everybody to, to look at, because I think a couple decades ago, People would have said AARP is a, a brand for retirees, and you, uh, in your tenure, have really shifted it to become a lifestyle. Well, you don't say it quite this way, but I think more of a lifestyle uh, brand that, that that you know facilitates every aspect of that. And so, what a great model, uh, you know, for what can be done. And congratulations to you and all the success at AARP. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. You know, like I said, every day we're looking to create this ageless society and to make sure that people understand the value of uh, older people and uh, and your AARP membership. So uh, we look forward to a growing uh, membership base. Well, thank you for being with us today, Joanne. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every few weeks, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues. Share it with your parents. Share it with your grandparents. Share it with your grandchildren if you're a boomer. We know that they want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board.
You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.